Well, thank you uh, all for being here again. My name is Jason Riley. I'm a, a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. And um, I am filling in as moderator for Glenn Lowry, um, who had to leave unexpectedly last evening. Um, and we've also added an additional uh, panelist, so um, the program doesn't quite match what you, what you uh, uh, have in front of you, but uh, please bear with us. Uh, the, the title of this um, panel discussion is The Economics and Politics of Race. It's a, uh, another book title uh, from Thomas Sowell, and um, it's one of my favorites. And in, the, in, in this book, in particular, um, we get one of Tom's uh, hallmark uh, traits, which is international comparisons. He's someone who uh, feels it's very important to look at uh, not just what is going on in the US, but what is going on in other countries, uh, and what has gone on in other countries uh, over, the, over the decades and even over the centuries. And that's something he does in this book. And in, in, um, in that spirit, uh, uh, I will introduce um, our first panelist here, Tony Sewell, who is an education consultant from the United Kingdom um, and is going to talk uh, about what's going on over there. This, this conversation we're having obviously is taking place in, in, in Dallas, Texas, but America is not the only place where these, these types of discussions are, are taking place. Uh, sitting to Tony's uh, left uh, is David Kaiser, who's an historian who has taught at Harvard and, and, and Carnegie Mellon among other, other places, and sitting to David's left is Howard Husak, who's a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. So, um, Tony, why don't I start with you? Um, you were uh, appointed by Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister of, of Britain, uh, to head a race commission a couple of years ago. And before you tell us uh, what you found in your report, um, why was the commission formed in the first place? Yeah, well, we did um, form that commission out of the story <clears throat> of um, Black Lives Matter and, the, and the, the response to George Floyd, because there was a sense that uh, in uh, the UK, we had our demonstrations, we followed you. And in a sense, you know, before I even go into this, I mean, the relationship between, I mean, you can see by my accent, I represent a strange phenomenon called a black, a black British uh, person. Um, first of all, I want to apologize for, on the behalf of Meghan Markle. We, did, we tried our best, but it didn't work out. So that's, another, <laughs> that's another story. And, I, and I, I just, just one observation on this is that I'm just, I, I say this to you, Jason, this is an observation before I get into this, is that um, I, I really think African-Americans shouldn't beat themselves up. I mean, there was just a, 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 a survey done, I think, about 10 years ago. Uh, it, was, it was 50 year olds, they're probably 50 now, but I mean, at, at the time, it was asked British um, couples what uh, music did they like or they, they, they put to when they were conceiving their first child. And 90% um, of the respondents said Marvin Gaye. <laughs> and, um, so what you've got now okay. is a whole generation of Englishmen <laughs> born and because right. of Marvin Gaye. <laughs> Marvin Gaye has produced the whole set of... And um, so, you know, you've got to be proud to be black and American, or more so American and black. I like that way of looking at it. But seriously, the, um, the issue around the... Uh, Commission came about because we had to look at that issue in the UK. We have a, a, a migrant population, I suppose, a, a, that came in the 50s in a big way, and we have several generations now uh, in that. And um, the result of that was quite interesting because it did link to much of what Tom Sowell says. Actually, I have, a, I have a problem with my surname. My surname is Sewell, and often people mix me up and they call me Tom Sowell as well, and they get, the whole thing gets mixed up. So, but I, it's one of those things where when people say all oh, black people look alike, I mean, I like to be confused with Tom Sowell. It's, kind of nice, it's a nice kind of confusion. But, um, but seriously, the, the, the outcomes were two things. First of all, we found that there was a series of race and ethnic disparities. They did exist in Britain. However, the reasons for them were not necessarily based on racism. 
that we, we, that we looked at issues around geography, socioeconomic, um, where, where you lived was a key driver for all of this. And uh, those elements um, came into play. Whether you were, you know, you're going to ask me this later, whether you were born in Britain or whether you were a migrant black person coming into Britain, all these elements came in, but very little really on, on race. Not that racism didn't exist, but that was the key driver. And the second thing was that we found a whole series of positive disparities. And um, to be honest, all hell went loose, really, when that report went out. And uh, we suffered the, 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 the scorn of the, the liberal progressives. You mean, so I, I have a quote here from the report. It says, uh, the, 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 the report found that the British system is not deliberately rigged against ethnic minorities. And you mean you weren't treated as a hero for this fight? <laughs> <laughs> we were not. The, the deal was that, like here, and I, I definitely agree with um, Shelby Steele, that the system was not stacked <coughs> against black people. It probably was back 60 years ago when I was, you know, 20 running around the streets of London. It, it, you know, the police would just pick you up and throw you in the back of a van. Yes, it happened then. But we've progressed since that time. And, and, and definitely, no, the system is not. And in fact, I use in the report, it was just so, when I was listening to Shelby about Britain being an open society now, mm -hmm. as opposed to being closed before. Okay. Um, Professor Kaiser, uh, you've spent a lot of time thinking about uh, the links between past experiences and, and the present day social realities we have in America. Um, how should we try and reckon with this, this history and, and understand and respond to the fact that um, there are, in, uh, in, in fact, economic, ongoing economic disparities in this country? Well, there is a lot of bad history out there on these questions because they are highly political questions. And I'm going to focus on one aspect to begin with, namely uh, a lot that is being said now and it has really become orthodoxy about the impact of the New Deal and what happened during the New Deal and after the after the Second World War to black Americans and why. Um, and I'm coming at this, may I make it clear from the beginning, from the perspective of a very unwoke New Deal Democrat, which is what I have always been and what I remain today. Now, one of the first big myths that's become very popular is that the Social Security program in 1935 was structured purposely to eliminate, to not to eliminate most black Americans because it didn't include domestics or farm laborers. As a matter of fact, this has been looked into very carefully, and it isn't true. It's true that it did not include domestics or farm laborers, but that had nothing to do with the power of Southern Democrats, who, it is now said, imposed this on FDR. It was a decision made by the administration planners and the executive branch simply because they thought it would be too complicated in the early stages of the program to include domestics and farm laborers. There is more to be said about this as well. First of all, uh, in 1935, there were four times as many white farm laborers as black ones, mm. and there were twice as many white domestics as black ones. So uh, more, far more white people suffered from those exclusions than black people. Secondly, there were other equally important exclusions that clearly had nothing to do with race in the original program. All government workers at every level didn't get Social Security, weren't part of the program. And nobody who worked for a nonprofit in education, for instance, was part of the program. And another interesting point about this, by 1941, President Roosevelt was arguing that domestics and farm laborers, or at least some of them, should be added. And by 1950, they were added, some of them, under amendments to the Social Security Act. Uh, so that is myth number one. Myth number two, which I actually heard from a very innocent co-member of this conference a couple of days ago, who was just saying what they had heard, uh, that black veterans were excluded from the GI Bill, that somehow they were left out of it altogether. This is completely false. The GI Bill was written in race-neutral language. Now, it is true that in the southern part of the country, where a majority of black people still live, 
it was very difficult for black veterans to take advantage of the educational benefits because there were so few places where they could go to college at all or perhaps a training school. But it has also been shown that in other parts of the country, black veterans took just about as much advantage of the GI Bill as white veterans did. And lastly, there is the issue of redlining, which you can read uh, from ta Coates and others, made it impossible for blacks to become homeowners and to accumulate wealth. Now instead, again, the real story is much more complex. Uh, redlining tried to identify neighborhoods that were poor credit risks. There's a huge study of it by a branch of the Fed. It's true that the racial composition of a community was regarded as a risk factor, but most of the people who were redlined were white. Uh, those neighborhoods did become blacker over the next 30 years. But the big question is, did redlining actually make it impossible for black Americans in large numbers to acquire homes and to acquire wealth? And the answer is, no, it didn't. Uh, and just to take a couple of more minutes and, and to go back to some statistics, which actually, some of which Jason mentioned uh, the other night. Housing, okay, despite redlining, despite housing seg segregation, and despite lower incomes, from 1940 to 1980, black home, home ownership rates rose from about 22% to about 43%. Almost doubled. That's a very big increase. Uh, the, the rise was quickest from 1940 to 1960. There was a parallel rise in the same period in white ownership from about 45% to 65%. Uh, there's a similar picture looking at the relationship of black income and white income. Despite segregation, lower education, job discrimination, the average black income as a percent of average white income rose from 50% in 1948 to about 67% in 1974. And during that period, average white income was increasing a lot as well. It is very interesting to note that all this black economic progress mainly took place before the passage of the Civil Rights Acts. Now, those acts were great achievements, they were very important, but uh, it is interesting that something else was going on. And the question is what, and I hope to turn to that later. The other point, and I will stop right now, uh, but come back to this, I hope, at some point later in the discussion. All this progress, relative and absolute, um, came to a halt. Well, not all the absolute progress, but the relative progress came to a halt uh, pretty much around 1980. And there has been very little progress ever since, just as ha there has been very little progress in the income level of the whole lower half of our population. And I hope to come back that, to that later uh, and to talk about what that means for where we are today and where we are going. But again, uh, th th this has really upset me. I've seen this happen before, professionally as a historian, for instance, about the history of the Cold War which was rewritten falsely as a result of the Vietnam War. And now uh, the history of this period, and not only this period of race relations has been rewritten, the 1619 Project, which we could have had a panel on too, uh, has been doing the same thing about other periods in American history. It's bad history in the service of bad politics, and it, it really is a danger to our national cohesion and to good policy. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and you, you make a very good point before I go to Howard that I think deserves to be reiterated about, um, I, I mention it a lot, Sol mentions it a lot, and you mentioned it, um, <clears throat> which is what was going on prior to the modern day civil rights movement, and particularly prior to the passage of the 1964 uh, uh, Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And what um, progressives on the left often say in response to that is, oh, you were, that means you were against those things, or you, you think those things weren't important. And that is not the point being made here. The point being made is that uh, uh, what, the progress that was happening notwithstanding the amount of discrimination that blacks faced. And, and the reason it's so important to make that point is because so many of today's disparities or today's lack of progress is based on racism. They're claiming it's racism. 
That's why we have these achievement gaps. That's why we have these employment gaps, racism. And, 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 the, and the, the, the reason to come, go back to, to when the passage of these, these modern day civil rights acts uh, occurred um, is to show that racism today is an insufficient explanation for disparities today because blacks of a previous generation obviously faced a hell of a lot more racism. Um, uh, but I just wanted to, to, to reiterate that point because it comes, up, it comes up quite a bit. I don't know any conservative, uh, black conservative, who thinks the passage of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act was a bad thing or unnecessary. Or, 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 or these, these acts made America more just. They are the crown jewel of what Martin Luther King and, and Thurgood Marshall and all the rest of those luminaries were fighting for. And, and I am very happy they occurred. Uh, uh, but that is not to say that blacks you know, didn't, weren't able to, to, to move upward in society uh, until they happened. Um, and, and that's what I think we're, we're, we're getting at. Let me just oh, we'll go over to, uh, to Howard. Okay. Howard, I don't know sure. if you want to respond uh, to anything you've heard first, but uh, uh, one of the reasons I asked Howard to join the panel is because uh, he's just written an excellent new book uh, called The Poor Side of Town. And it is about uh, housing policies uh, in this country uh, over the past century. And um, I wanted uh, Howard to talk about why he wrote that book and how he thinks it applies to um, uh, the issues we're discussing uh, on this panel. Well, thanks, Jason. Thanks for including me in the last minute. Uh, I was strongly motivated to write this because the New Deal and the Fair Deal, whatever their other accomplishments, were disastrous, the disastrous beginnings of housing policy that has undermined black wealth. And I speak specifically about public housing and urban renewal and the progeny that continue today when 48% uh, of public housing remains black today, 45% of Section 8 housing, far disproportionate. These are all, all uh, residential settings which one cannot accumulate wealth. You can't own public housing. So let's talk about how the New Deal and progressivism, particularly, uh, undermined this accumulation of black wealth that were, was ongoing, as you point out. So there were strong black communities in, this, in the United States. There was a community called Black Bottom in Detroit. It was not a racial reference. It referred to the original soil of the area. There was DeSoto Carr in, in uh, St. Louis. There was uh, certainly in, in Harlem, Cleveland, Bronzeville in Chicago. These were neighborhoods that were thriving centers of black home ownership. The, the rap on these neighborhoods is they were slums. They needed to go. They were slums. In fact, when you look at the census data, you find out that there was 20 to 30 percent home ownership and an even larger percentage of what I call in the book owner presence. That is, you had people renting out the second and third floors of small homes. So you had social capital, to use Glenn Lowry's phrase, right, that was being accumulated because there was a web, an interconnecting web of ownership, tenant presence. This was completely disregarded by the advent of public housing. Black Bottom demolished, demolished. This was where Aretha Franklin's father had the Bethel AME Church. It was taken for urban renewal. DeSoto Carr in St. Louis, again, a center of black uh, ownership, uh, home ownership, and small business. There were 300 black-owned businesses in Black Bottom in Detroit, 300. DeSoto Carr in St. Louis replaced with 33 high-rise public housing towers called Pruitt Igo. This was not only progressivism that believed that black neighborhoods were de facto slums and needed to be demolished, but it was modernism writ large. This was the Corbusier City of Tomorrow, 33 towers designed by Yamasaki, who would go on to design the World Trade Center in New York. Only 19 years after they were built, they were so derelict, they had to be demolished. This is what a failure public housing is. 
we continue to deny the underlying assumptions about public housing were false, that the private sector was going to fail poor people. The private sector was not failing poor people with housing. It was building hundreds and millions of small homes on small lots that black people, poor white people, striving working class people owned and that were labeled as slums. We continue to compound these mistakes today. Public housing remains. Joe Biden wants to expand the housing voucher program by 200,000 vouchers. Here's what's wrong with that. If you live in subsidized housing, you pay a fixed percentage of your income as rent. Here's what that means. If your income goes up, your rent goes up. Who in this room would sign a lease like that, right? But that's what we do to poor black people in this country. Single parent, we encourage the formation of single parent families through this program, by the way, because if you're, the poorer you are, you go to the head of the line to get this subsidized housing. We're steering and helping to incentivize the creation of single family, yeah. uh, si single parent families. Last thing I'm gonna say is, among the other compounding mistakes, the Community Reinvestment Act, which is supposed to direct banks to allocate capital to poor neighborhoods of color. Here's what it's done. It's prompted banks to check a box. We'll make these loans, but we don't care whether they perform well or not. It's just a cost of doing business. But it's when you live next door to a, a, a homeowner who really didn't have <coughs> wherewithal to pay that mortgage and the home becomes vacant, this is a disaster for you too. And now the Community Reinvestment Act, the new vice president of the Fed, her name is Lael Brainerd, has written that the Community Reinvestment Act should become explicitly race-based. This is new. It's still going on. All of these factors undermine the accumulation of black wealth through misguided housing policies. Tony. Uh, I mean, it's quite interesting you talk about that because in the UK, when we, something similar happened, uh, when I suppose black mass migration comes to, the, to Britain from the Caribbean, they face um, a very strange situation where they'd go for rented housing to be told to be faced signs that said, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish. And that was the sign <laughs> that they said. I don't know what the Irish are throwing in there for, but they were there. And uh, it's quite interesting it, how these phenomenon of disadvantage actually, in a way, flips you into another scenario. When we looked, when we looked at the report, we found that the Caribbean population in Britain disproportionately were the highest homeowners compared to the rest wow. of the other groups. What happened, it forced my parents to then go into the private sector market and buy houses. Usually, you know, generalized Jewish owners, sometimes it wasn't, sometimes other people had those homes and they bought them very cheaply. Then here's where it gets really interesting. That group then becomes ho homeowners in, in relatively poor areas. They then hold on to those homes, a bit like Harlem. Those areas become gentrified, and over a period of about 20 odd years, they become millionaires because the, <laughs> the, the, the housing um, just gets, zooms up in price. And I see now, I'm, I, I took the plane here from Jamaica, and there are areas in Jamaica where people have cashed in on the gentrification been able to go back home after those years and are, and are solid millionaires. And, and on top of that, there's a second thing to it. When uh, Margaret Thatcher decided to um, privatise the public housing, it meant that those, again, Caribbean black people who had those houses were able to sell them into the market, cash in, and then at the same time become millionaires. So we have a, we have a, it's, it's a very strange phenomenon around that whole area of, 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 of how you see private housing and how it works for poor people. And in a sense, we would say that our added value, and it's there in the report, that housing and the ability to home, own homes 
has been really, for, for black people in Britain anyway, for that Caribbean population, has been their, their, their value, their, their added value in, in, that, in, that, in that context. I know you wanted to, to, to follow up, David, in, in, uh, uh, to what you've heard, but I also wanted okay. you to answer this. Um, uh, what you were describing earlier in terms of uh, these programs uh, and these policies and, and uh, whether it was Social Security, other New, New Deal policies, whether it was redlining, um, uh, these policies are cited as the rationale for slavery reparations That's for right. blacks. That's right. But what you're saying is that more whites were redlined than blacks. More, more whites suffered from the Social Security policies initially than blacks. So if you're going to build a case for reparations yeah. on Social Security policy and redlining of the past, it's going to get, it's going to have to include a lot more people than ta Coates wants to include. Well, Jason, let me get to the next chapter of the last 40 years, which raises a huge related point. I talked about this black progress coming to an end then uh, in many ways, and the same thing happened to the lower half of the white population where there's been stagnation as well. And indeed, and this has come up, and uh, Charles Murray, Coming Apart, an absolutely amazing book, I think, <coughs> laid this out very clearly. All, just about all the major problems affecting the black community today are affecting larger numbers of whites. There are more white single mothers than black single mothers today. Uh, there are more poor white people than poor black people today. Uh, of course, uh, again, the, the, the buzzword uh, in the woke community is disproportion. And, and disproportion is true, but uh, we also have a system of one person, one vote in the United States. And in, in addition, uh, the, the, the difficulties of one white family headed by a single mother are just as serious as one black family was headed by a single mother, et cetera. And, but, but, but the big issue, and here my New Deal roots come up again, and having read most of Roosevelt's speeches, is this. If you want to do something about a social problem, no matter how you want to do something about it, doesn't it make more sense to point out the breadth of the problem and the vast numbers of people who are affected by it, who belong to every racial group, instead of trying to privilege one particular racial group because of history that amounts to 13% of the population and does not represent a majority of the people who are affected. The answer to me is obvious. You want to identify both the problem and the solution in the broadest possible way if you want to get the broadest possible support. And as just been pointed out, uh, the Democratic Party, I regret to say, even more now is going in the opposite direction. It, it, is, it is pushing harder and harder for specifically race-based solutions to what I don't think is a race-based problem. It's a problem of the evolution of our economy, and let me take this opportunity to throw in the other point I wanted to make sure to, to, to make, which has to do with the Fairmont Conference, which we are commemorating. Not anything that happened in the Fairmont Conference, but that conference coincided with the beginnings of our great free market experiment uh, of the return to the free market here in the United States, which has dominated economic policy under both parties, really, for the last 40 years. And, and again, speaking in a room of mostly conservatives and Republicans and coming from a different perspective and, and trying to reach across the aisle, I think it's time for all of us to take another look at this and ask uh, exactly what has this done to the United States? Have, has it really landed us in the place we want to go? Uh, has it, it, hasn't it created more inequality? Hasn't it created all sorts of problems? Certainly it's created a housing crisis in every major metropolitan area, so that for instance in the Boston area where I live, uh, not only do poor people have trouble buying a home, assistant professors at Harvard and MIT can't <laughs> buy a single family home in commuting distance. Uh, I, I mean, this is a serious problem having to do with the extraordinary uh, concentration of wealth that we have created. So, so we all need to think about that if we're going to make progress. But, and, and last but not least, the way our politics have evolved, the way black activism has evolved, and also the way on the other side many Republicans have appealed to white people, we now have a very different situation politically than we had in the middle of the century. 
In the middle of the century, income was a pretty good predictor of how you voted. Uh, if you were in the bottom half of the population, you probably voted Democratic. If you were in the top half, you probably voted Republican. Now, we have the situation where poor non-white people vote Democratic in overwhelming majorities. Poor white people vote Republican in a large uh, percentage. Uh, for me, as a Democrat, that's very sad. For me, as a citizen, I think that's a potentially catastrophic situation, uh, which really threatens the country. Thanks. I know. Well, I, I, I'm not going to debate the whole Thomas Piketty critique of neoliberalism here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'd be glad to. Right. Right. But, but, but I will say this about, about housing and wealth accumulation and the high prices in the Boston area. I don't believe that every metropolitan area has a housing crisis. I think we're seeing post the pandemic, and, and this will affect uh, uh, black home ownerships. For instance, by the way, Tony, in T Bedford Stuyvesant in New York, former ghetto that became gentrified, they're cashing out and moving to South Carolina yeah. in big numbers, and they're millionaires too. Yeah. Right? So ghettos can change. That's right. right. Cities can change. The housing problem we have is a housing construction shortfall, right? It's not because inequality is so fundamental and we're going back to the New Deal when the progressives said the private housing market will fail two thirds of the population. That's what they believed and that's why they thought public housing was gonna be for two thirds of the population. It was gonna be like a public utility. They were as broad as could be. Here's what's wrong. We're just not building enough housing we had a secret formula for housing. It was the formula that was used in communities of color all over this country. Small houses on small lots. It makes it cheap. We've gotten to the point, though, where we have a problem with zoning across the country, right? And we're, gonna, we're hearing again, well, we have to use federal funds to punish these exclusionary suburbs. Well, good luck with that. You're going to create a political backlash like you never saw before. Instead, what we have to do, this is what we need to do as citizens, is go to each town planning board and say, we're not wanting to build subsidized housing. We're not wanting to build high-rise projects here. We just want to build slightly smaller houses so that people can move up about upper mobility. So your kids, your teachers, your policemen, your firefighters can live in your community. It used to be that way. Every community had title of my book, The Poor Side of Town. They all had it. They all understood this. It was based in affordability that naturally occurred. We have a struggle ahead of us to try to bring that back. But if we do, one of the heroes of my book is Johnny Ray Youngblood, who is a minister from uh, uh, East New York, East Brooklyn congregations, and he built the Nehemiah homes. The Nehemiah homes are just like those row houses in Philadelphia and anywhere else, the terrace houses in London, right? small homes on small lots. People are building wealth there today. That's the secret. Um, Tony, uh, I wanted you to go back to the report. Uh, you, you, you've spoken about the, the differences between the academic performance in, in Britain of uh, Caribbean blacks and African blacks, and and what you conclude from yeah. from those different outcomes, or uh, what we could, what we can, what we should conclude yeah. from those different outcomes. I mean, vis-a-vis -vis discrimination. Yeah, and it, and, it, and there are parallels here. Um, can I just say that the population in Britain? I mean, it, it's it, it, you've got to try and get your head around it. Some of it really is that it's changed. So, for example, the black population now, I would say, is predominantly and it's changing now, it would be an African one. It was, it was uh, in the 50s and the beginning, my generation, a Caribbean one. And that, that, that shifted uh, for, for different reasons, mainly through um, migration patterns. And um, what, 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 we, what we have then is a strange phenomenon where that new African population comes in and the exam results for that group as now almost leading the country. Yeah. And to the point where, wow. and, and, and this is where we get um, kind of a strange phenomenon going on in Britain, where in London, and, you, and to understand Britain, you've got to understand London 
in relation to the rest of the country because you might as well just cut that thing out and it might be, as well be a country unto itself because it bears no resemblance to the rest of the country. And inside London is the black population, it really is. But yet they're producing black and Asian population. By Asian, we don't necessarily mean the same thing you mean as Asian. We're talking about Indian, Pakistani background, yeah? And um, those three groups are now, now lead the way with the white group behind, way behind. And um, inside the, that difference is, and in explaining it and, and, and in, in Thomas Sowell terms, how you can go with it is look at these numbers. The Caribbean population, 60% are from single parents. Mm. The African population, about 30, 40%. Now, they're sitting in the same classrooms together. You go in a classroom and you would, it'd be hard to know who is who, you know, on, on a visual level. However, once you take out that, those numbers, you see the African population or the African groups flying way ahead and the Caribbean population way behind. In fact, Caribbean population is even behind the white group that's doing the worst. And so we can only land it in one Wait, phenomenon. So the, the, African, the African population is outperforming That's right. the white population. Yeah. yeah. So you have that, that, that kind of trend going on. And so we can only land it in one area, which is, again, causes a lot of, a lot of controversy. We, where else can you go but the family? Where else can you go but what we call immigrant optimism? Yeah? That's the driver in that, um, a guy named John Ogbu, I don't know if you know his work, um, uh, located that uh, in schools in America where those, the, the, the Caribbean yes. group. John Ogbu, well. yes, yes. Let, let, let me tell you a strange kind of phenomenon, but the Caribbean group that comes to America does very well. Yeah. This is, this is yes. where it gets very strange, <laughs> yeah? Um, but the Caribbean, we, I just think, I said to my mother, you should, you should have stayed in Jamaica and then we should have gone to the US <laughs> to come to England. <laughs> but um, so the group that goes, comes out of Jamaica and goes to, to New York do really well. But, but, but my, my generation didn't do well in England. And so we have this, this strange kind of a difference in the way in which that, that Caribbean population operates. Yeah. Um, <coughs> David, uh, uh, and let's make the next set of questions or answers short so we can get to yeah. the Q&A. But um, uh, let's concede on the reparations point. Let's, what, what if we conceded that um, uh, uh, these policies of the past, those security redlining housing policies, dis disproportionately uh, affected blacks? Uh, and, and, and so um, let's move forward with reparations. Are, are you convinced that uh, and, and I'm, I'm picturing reparations as, at the end of the day, another wealth redistribution scheme. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, 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 in whatever form, Robert Doerr sat where, where Howard was yesterday and said, government's very good at sending checks to people. <laughs> we do it quite well. Um, are you convinced that another wealth redistribution scheme in the form of slavery reparations would get the job done? With that, that that is the key to the upward mobility of, 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 uh, of, of blacks in this country? Well, I hope I didn't give anybody the no, no, impression no. that I, the answer no, no, might be yes. No, I'm, I'm asking. Uh, no, of course not. And it, it, rest of, the way redistribution works is if it's done, shall I say, I'm making this up as I go along, through private sector mechanisms. In other words, b by paying low wage workers more, which is what we began doing in the 30s and continued yeah. to do for all that time. Yeah. Uh, we had a labor intensive economy, a growing economy, we had strong unions, mm -hmm. uh, we had an easy path upward for people right out of high school. Yeah. Do we have that now? Certainly not to the same extent. Right, right, no, uh, my, my only point was that right. it, 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 the but, slavery but no, reparations I, argument is not only weak on, on the terms of social security and redlining, it's also weak just simply uh, in, in terms of its utility in addressing 
uh, racial inequality today. That's that's the only that's right. Point and I was and in fact, to, yeah. as you may know, there's a there's a team, two scholars. I can't remember their names, but but I've heard them interviewed, and they've written a book about this, mm -hmm. and and they have pegged it at twelve trillion dollars or so to equalize the wealth gap, yeah. uh, which is a non-starter politically and would create enormous. Is this Darity? Uh, a big, I I. Sandy Darity. I'm not sure. Okay. Okay. Right. Right. Anyway, yeah. uh, no, I, I think it's a non-starter politically, and, and I think it's a terrible idea. And, and, and the, the issue of who would be eligible is very complicated. Right. But, but again, no, the, the problem mm -hmm. is to restructure our economy to a certain extent so that the whole lower half of the population can do much better again. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we have to focus on. I, I do want to mention one other thing. Um, and uh, I'm staying away from cultural arguments. I I'm not saying I don't buy them at all, yeah. but, but I do think the macroeconomic picture is important too. I want to ask, how many people here uh, ever served in the US military? <laughs> not very many, okay. I think those of you who did will agree with me that for the lower half of our population, the end of the draft was really a catastrophe. Uh, in many ways. Uh, it, it integrated people, you met people from other walks of life, and it provided very important basic skills training for millions and millions of Americans, black and white, who could take that into civilian life. And that was in 1973, and, and I think that's been a, another big contributor to the reversal of the trend. Okay, uh, can we open it up? Just one quick thing. Okay, go ahead. The problem with reparations and wealth redistribution is it, it mistakes gaining money with gaining the, the life skills and life approach that one needs to accumulate wealth and actually to pursue happiness. So it's the very process of striving and saving which is, needs to be rewarded. Okay. Okay. Um, let's open it up, uh, Professor. So I, I think it's important to kind of share references across disciplines. Uh, there's a very famous paper in economics called Progress After Myrdal, which was written by Finus uh, Welch and James Smith, published in 1989. They were the first people to have electronic versions of the census data, and because of the 70 two-year rule and some things. They had the 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. And then they went forward and they documented in gory detail uh, the claims that were made. Um, I wrote a paper in 2006 that you can get on my website called Why Is Black-White Skill Convergence Stopped? And if you look not only at economics, but at education and test scores, I would date the uh, end of progress at about 1988 rather than 1980. Um, and if you took the progress that we saw from se through the 70s and 80s on the educational metrics, um, I estimated that by 2070, there would have been no more uh, black-white achievement gap at that rate, um, and you would have had an integrated society. And so something went terribly wrong in terms of these trends about 1988. And I don't know, I've worked on it for years, I never figured out exactly what happened. Um, I think it's a logical matter, even though there was great progress before, um, forms of racism could still be slowing things down now. Those two are not uh, logically uh, exclusive. And the last thing I'll say, Ed Olson at the University of Virginia has a whole career uh, documenting with data how public housing is a disaster on the dimension of it takes a dollar for a big city housing agency to provide 50 cents worth of housing services. Uh, it's an incredibly wasteful way uh, to deliver housing uh, to people in need. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. 
Uh, this is a question for David I'm over here. Um, so when we when we talk about the the race neutrality of some of the uh, New Deal policies, is it important to tease out the Deep South in terms of how those policies were administered? You mentioned the GI Bill. When my dad came back, sorry, uh, uh, during the during the Korean War, my dad told me. He didn't find out about the GI Bill until the 70s, because in Alabama, they didn't tell the black soldiers about the program, because the whites who were in control of, of administering those only told the whites about the program. So you're right on paper, there was some race neutrality, but I think in, it, it may be important in some of these discussions to tease out the deep south oh. in terms of, of the administration. Is that, is that fair? What do you think? I think that's entirely fair, uh, certainly, and, and I thought I tried to say that. I do want to throw in another thing, though, which, again, is a political story and just makes me so sad. Um, the New Deal had huge impact in the South on, on, on both white and black people who were in such desperate straits, with the result that up until the Civil Rights Act, the Civil Rights Movement, in the mid-60s, there was a cadre of important white Southern politicians who were extremely liberal on everything except race and, and, and who were New Dealers in every way. People like Lister Hill and John Sparkman, the senators from uh, Alabama, and Hugo Black, actually, w was like that before he was on the Supreme Court. And I'm sure some of them were closet egalitarians about race, but they couldn't say so. And one of the great tragedies, uh, the, the gains of the Civil Rights Movement were critical. Uh, the Civil Rights Movement in the Deep South was heroic, but uh, it's a great tragedy that white demagoguery, as personified by George Wallace, took over. And, and that tradition really was wiped out in, in the Deep South and, and hasn't come back, even though uh, the Deep South remains the poorest part of the country and the part that's in, most in need of something like that. Yeah, you know, I'm just, I thought you were going to get there. Uh, is, is an explanation for what you discussed, what's happened to the public education system? Mm -hmm. Seems to me that is pretty fundamental. Uh, well, I'm a product of public education, and it wasn't bad. Now, that wasn't South or the Midwest, but it's gotten a lot, however bad it was, it was it's gotten a lot worse, a lot worse, I think. Yeah. Um, for David, um, I like the myths of the New Deal that you pointed out. And one of the things that caught my uh, ear was the redlining piece. And so in my last book, I wrote about some of the myths they say about redlining. But the interesting thing is I wasn't talking about the New Deal. I was talking about thought papers and articles about how redlining is still going on. So can we talk about a bit from the politics of race how we need to find a way to tell the truth about like how it does in housing, about the current ideas and how they're saying, you know, we need more public housing or how they're saying, you know, Nicole Hannah-Jones and the others talking about anti-black racism and, the, and, and slavery and all those things are still happening. So we need to find a way through history and your research to point out that is a myth going on about things that are happening today that aren't happening. Yeah, let, let me add that. Maybe Howard, you want to jump in on this, what, but it's, one Howard. of the solutions that they put forward to this, for this problem, is sprinkling black people in white neighborhoods through <laughs> using <laughs> government incentives to do so. And I wanted you to talk about the history of, of trying to do that, shoehorn people into neighborhoods they wouldn't otherwise be able to afford to live in, and how counterproductive that can be in terms of the, the racial tension that can result. In other words, we've come a lot, a long way in terms of the, the willingness of whites to have black neighbors. But nobody wants to live next door to someone who wouldn't otherwise be able to live next door but for subsidies from the government <laughs> and bringing a certain lifestyle into that community and all the rest of the baggage that can come with it. Right, so that's called affirmatively furthering fair housing, right? And it is, it is very much in vogue today. Uh, Donald Trump reversed it, demagogued about it, I have to say, 
uh, and uh, Joe Biden is restoring it. They're working out regulations, but it's the whole idea. It's a lot like discussion about integrated schools. Like, unless you have white neighbors, you can't yeah. be upwardly mobile. It's gonna, it's gonna like what? How, how, is that osmosis? As opposed to you've got to do what it takes to get there, and then there's a reward for that. Among the strongest opponents, and I have done uh, journalism uh, specifically on the south suburbs of Chicago, Westchester County, New York, which both of these are ground zero for this, the black middle class is very much opposed to this, yes. right? They have worked hard and played by the rules, gotten to their small house in the suburb with the white picket fence, and now the projects are coming to them. Yes. That's yes. how they think about it. So this is terribly undermining. David, did you want to? No, that's okay. okay. I, I appreciate you adjusting to me, but he knows a lot more about the contemporary situation I, than I, I do. Just, so I just fine. add one, <laughs> one academic reference yeah. uh, because uh, I'm getting an example to do that. Herbert Gans, kind of the dean of American sociology, wrote a paper in 1961 called Homogeneity and Heterogeneity about how neighborhoods are stable, including how they're racially stable. And that points out if you're from similar socioeconomic status, race drops out of the discussion. Interesting. Yeah. Something that, that just stands out to me, especially after uh, hearing the description of the kind of muddled way that we kind of conceive of a concept like Asianness, and there's this kind of actual diversity that exists there that's obscured by our dependence on these, these categories. Um, I'm thinking about just the general premise of the conversation about disparities here, and I'm wondering, and this is perhaps a question for the room, um, if there's anyone in the room who, if confronted with a circumstance where the, the total number of people impoverished in America or number of children sentenced to failing schools were identical, but the racial disparities disappeared, would we mark that as progress? Uh, I'll give you another analogy. If the total number of people in this country who were impoverished increased by 10%, but the racial disparities disappeared, would we mark that as progress? And I know that there is a determination to talk about disparities on the left and a fixation on those things um, for whatever reason, but I wonder if it isn't better to circumvent those conversations uh, rather than to devote so much attention to kind of forensic analysis of these issues. I think there's something Glenn said that, that is obviously true and generally accepted that race is a social construct, but race is also an ideological commitment. And it's one that most of us make without thinking about. And I don't think we spend enough time thinking about the degree to which race is an endowment that we've all received that is plenty malignant. Yeah. And that is perhaps worth exercising from most of our conversations and perhaps completely from most of our efforts to try and improve the quality of people's lives. Yeah. Can, I, can I just ask, um, in, in some ways, I, you make a good point, but I think that as, as a sort of outside observer to this, and we, 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 I think in the UK, we've kind of now got to grips with this. This, this thing is a class-driven thing. Yeah. And I, I do get the sense in the America that there is a sense of the, the that the obsessiveness with race and this unwillingness to look at the class phenomenon. I mean, I mean, in, in education now, we've got a very strange scenario where, in fact, our ethnic minority groups, whatever you want to call them, black, well, they'll be of, of obviously African origin, and, and, and Asian, as I said, from Indian and, and Pakistan, we're going to have to now take almost the the secrets, the kind of the, the, the positive best practice, and go and share that now with the white group. <laughs> we have to flip that over. And so we've got now projects. It's almost like colonialism in reverse. You know, we, we, we're going to have to go out now. We've got, we've got projects going out to the white poor groups to share the great things that's going on in our London migrant community. That's, that's how it has to be now, because the thing is on a class level. It, ne it never re I mean, a race thing came in, but, and, I, and I just feel that in America, when I look, I just think this notion of the poor white people in your country 
and a way in which we've got to, you've got to have a conversation with them and bring them into the room. Somewhere this education thing has got a link and maybe we're just over obsessed with race. And I think that's really where we feel. And I, 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 I love what Shelby said uh, the other day about this, this notion of just take that oppression thing out of the way and then you, you see clearly where the barriers are, you know. So um, yeah, we're, 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 we're busy trying to help poor white people and it's, it's black people that are doing it. I, I, you know, there, there, there are no black people and there are no white people, try that. We're busy trying to help poor people. We're trying to give them the right values and inculcate them with the right principles. I think there's something liberating about actually recognizing that, that immutable fact. Anyone I mean, that was the goal in the 60s, was race is going to fade away as a factor in the United States of America, and it certainly has to happen. We have a lot of black immigrants, immigrants of color in the United States, and there's a risk that, uh, I'll just call them the progressive left, are going to be trying to use them in certain ways. I'll give you an example. Uh, in Minneapolis, you have a really large Somali immigrant population. These are African people. And the progressives who control the city government in Minneapolis said, well, we've done some research, and Minneapolis is the most racially unequal city in the United States. <laughs> go, well, OK, so you have 100,000 dirt poor Somali refugees come, and you call them black, and then you say that justifies a whole series of policies. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So we don't want to assimilate black immigrants into this dysfunctional way of thinking. Yes. Your uh, story about the situation in the UK just reminded me of an anecdote from a colleague of mine at National Review who was writing about a uh, Native American education reformer. And he asked him if he was ever accused of acting white, you know, this whole cliche. And he said, acting white? No, I'm, I'm trying to act Chinese or maybe Jewish. You know, acting <laughs> white is not nearly good enough. <laughs> And, but if you look at our uh, census data, maybe it's acting Nigerian now actually would be a gooder, a better uh, measure. I'm <laughs> oh, sorry. Go, go, go. <laughs> um, David, I was struck by your uh, comment about bad history and uh, service of bad politics. And the bad history of the moment is the 1619 Project, which is not just a history, it's a curriculum. And it's being taught in virtually every school district in, in the country. If you want to convince Americans that uh, inequality is permanent, inescapable, and existential condition, uh, you might begin by uh, taking the whole of American history and putting it through the lens of the 1619 Project. Uh, we learned that the American Revolution didn't happen. It was actually a little uh, effort to preserve the institution of slavery against the British abolishing it. Things that are completely ludicrous and made up, but are now being taught to children who have no basis to object to them or to uh, think of them critically. So it seems to me that if we're going to be driving into the sources of social inequality, we now have a system that is uh, propagandizing a false inequality in order to perpetuate the racial divisions in the country. I think that's absolutely true. I regret that my profession has really laid down on this job. There is a tiny minority of historians who really know the history of slavery, the American Revolution, et cetera. It's only about half a dozen of them, and they're all old, who have, <laughs> who have spoken out directly against it. There's a slightly younger guy named John Oakes who actually wrote the most brilliant refutation because he went after their economic data and he went after their footnotes. And, and this happened in Cold War history, too. When you check these people's footnotes, often you find out that the source says more or less the opposite of what they said it said. <laughs> uh, and, and that's not a joke. It's true. So it, it is a very serious matter. And I feel very strongly, and I've blogged a lot about this, there's only one way to really understand the issue of equal rights in American history. It's been a battle from the word go, from the time of the revolution. There have always been people on both sides. Uh, to give one of the greatest examples, which I'm sure very few people know, in the debate over the Articles of the Confederation, they were debating a clause 
that said that any citizen of any state uh, would be a citizen of all the states. The delegates from South Carolina stood up and said, we would like to make a slight amendment. <laughs> Could we insert the word white between any and citizen? That was voted down. Hmm. That was before the Constitution. That is what I would like to point out, among other things, to all the people who say that the Constitution purposely intended to leave out black people, and also to all the people who say the Constitution purposely intended to leave out women, who say the word woman doesn't appear in the Constitution. No, it doesn't. But can anybody tell me the other word that doesn't appear in the Constitution? Man. Persons was the founders' favorite word. God bless them. That is the heritage we have. That is the heritage we can make use of. To throw it out <laughs> would be a disaster. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, that's all the time we have. Please thank my panel, and thank you all for your attention. Thank you.